service with Haber and Martinez. I am Haber. That's Martinez. Um, how you doing, Ed? I don't know. I'm looking at myself on the screen. Why do I look so angry? Uh, I don't know. It's one of those Mondays. I, I'm feeling pretty good. I'm wearing my Second Amendment shirt since we're since we're going to talk about Second Amendment stuff to a certain degree. You're not, um, you're, you're not wearing a tie and a shirt. No, I knew you'd be in a t-shirt, so I came back from court, oh. stripped down, and threw on something comfortable. Very That's nice. What I'm wearing. Very nice. You like that? So, Avenging Angels. So the folks know today's show has been entitled "Shooting the Shit About Shooting and Shit." Uh, what we did was we took two different cases. One is a local case uh, here from Miami-Dade County, City of Opelika. I pulled the affidavit, uh, the, the, the probable cause affidavit this morning. So Ed and I have it. We've had an opportunity to review it and we'll share it with you. As you know, that probable cause affidavit is a statement by law enforcement containing those facts and circumstances that they believe sufficient to constitute probable cause to make an arrest. And stay tuned because I actually have information that I just found out about that case. It's not on the A form and it's not anywhere. So okay, good. Well, because I personally I was not surprised because it's the city of Opalaka, uh, but that A form is 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 horribly written. It's a pathetic document. Um, really sad excuse for law enforcement. But that said, it's good you have additional information to chime in. Anyhow, that case, as you guys will find out, involves a shooting with necessarily a firearm. Well, I guess not necessarily. You could shoot somebody with a bow and arrow, couldn't you? Or even a or even a spitball. Yes, sure. um, and, and by the way, if you have some communicable disease, that spitball could be an aggravated battery with a deadly weapon. But I digress. So uh, we're going to compare and contrast this gentleman's local Opalaka case, which is a shooting case. And we're going to kind of look at it from the self-defense slash stand your ground perspective and, and kind of analyze it as we see it again noting that we only know what we know and that there's an awful lot more that we don't know. For instance, I've never met or spoken to Mr. Munoz, the subject of that case. I don't know what his version of events is. I only know what the police have alleged. There is no doubt, as there always is, more to the story. That said, we're going to compare and contrast that with a case that's far beyond uh, both Ed and I's jurisdictional boundaries. And that is the case of a 24-year-old a uh, former Marine, now civilian, named Daniel Perry, Penny. You may know Daniel Penny uh, either by face or name or just by story. Back in May, he was riding a New York City subway when an individual boarded the train and, uh, according to reports, engaged in threatening, aggressive, and dangerous behavior, at which point uh, Mr. Penny took it upon himself to uh, subdue the subject and afterwards, the subject uh, wound up dying. Uh, he was charged by Manhattan District Attorney Bragg's office. And you use with, that term loosely. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll, you know, avoiding the politics of it, we'll analyze it as we do, um, which, which is very well, difficult to do without bringing politics well, into it because it's almost purely political. I wasn't but, talking politics. I think it's a pathetic choice on his part. But go ahead. Be, be that as it may. We're going to compare and contrast that. It's a different type of defense situation. And what we're going to talk to you guys about is a little bit about the law of self-defense and how it morphs into stand your ground, which is kind of like self-defense on steroids. But we're going to talk about three different components, only two of which, neither of which are the one that you would normally think of, apply to these two cases, which is what makes it so interesting, at least as I see it. Traditional, normal self-defense or stand your ground, usually we're talking about somebody acting because they are in fear for themselves, right? I'm walking to my car. Somebody comes up to me and pulls out a knife. I happen to be armed. I pull out my gun and shoot him. That, that would be the traditional self-defense slash stand your ground type scenario. But the case with Mr. Munoz did not involve self-defense with regards to his person. It regarded what we call defense of property or at least that's what I'm led to believe. And with regards to Mr. Penny, he himself was not afraid of the individual whom he subdued. Rather, he acted in what's called defense of others. He was in fear for innocent people, including women and children, who were on the subway train and being subjected to this individual's threats 
So his act was not self-defense. It was defense of others. All three of those things, to some degree or another, personal self-defense, defense of others, and defense of property, are contemplated under Florida law. So when we talk about Mr. Penny's case, even though it is a New York case, we will be applying the Florida standard. Again, neither Ed nor I are licensed in, in New York. Uh, you know, apart from superficially reviewing their statutes, we're not competent to opine on them, and we won't. So we will treat it as if Florida had a subway system or a mass transportation system like New York's, and that had happened here as opposed to there. So uh, with that, Ed, where do you want to start? I don't know. Uh, you take it. You take it. I'll jump in wherever you're at. You want to start so with the form on let's, New let's, let, let's start with my favorite subject on earth, which is history and etymology. Um, let's go back a little bit and talk about self-defense. Self-defense is what we call a common law defense. It is an affirmative defense. An affirmative defense means that you are admitting that you did what the government accuses you of doing, but you're saying that the reasons that it was done, the reasons that you engaged in those behavior, justify the actions that you took and constitute an affirmative defense or an explanation that is legally justifiable that prohibits you being prosecuted. In other words, you, had, you felt like you had no choice and in this case, to save your own life. or self right. For self-defense, that's the standard. But there are other types of affirmative defenses, right. right? Like you can, affirmative defense, one of them is called alibi, right? You're accused of doing X, you weren't there. Another one you, is entrapment. I'm not saying I didn't deliver the drugs or purchase the drugs. I'm just saying that I only did it because of their inducements and, and them coercing me into doing something right. I ordinarily wouldn't have done. The point is, when it comes to any affirmative defense, the burden shifts from the government to prove the case to the defendant to assert the affirmative defense. And that's really the trick right out of the gate. All the defendant needs to do is establish facts sufficient to put the defense into play. It's what we call a prima facie case. The defendant does not need to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he or she acted in self-defense in order to raise the affirmative defense, but they do need to put forth sufficient information to get the defense in play. Once that's done, the burden shifts to the government to rebut it. So that's kind of the dynamic here, but let's go back to the issue of common law. So common law is old law that came here from England. That's basically the, the, the easiest definition I can give you. A lot of what we have here in American jurisprudence, whether it's federal criminal law, or any law in any of the 50 individual states, all of those things developed once the Constitution was written and once state constitutions started to be written and once statutes started to become passed and enacted, both on federal and state levels. But the concepts for most of these things came from England because most of the people who drafted the Constitution either came from England themselves or were descendants of people who came from England or from other places in Europe, because you had pilgrims uh, that came, you know, before the co colonials. Uh, you had pilgrims that came even earlier, and some of them were from uh, Dutch countries and things along those lines. But mostly this stuff traces back to English common law. And self-defense is an old principle that says, more or less in, 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 in the easiest terms I can suggest, hey, if you feel that you are in danger, then you have the right to take responsible, reasonable action to protect yourself from the danger that you face, provided certain things happen. Number one, the force that you choose to use is commensurate or reasonable in light of the force being used against you. And number two, at common law and in self-defense states that do not have standard ground like Florida, you had what was called a duty to retreat in other words, if you could flee, you were required to flee with one exception, and that is if you were in your own home. So if somebody broke into your house, you didn't have to leave your house. You were able to use force in your home. But if it happened on the street or anywhere else, then you had to, to flee or retreat if you could. And that's an, so interesting, th that's an interesting, interesting note, Michael, that you made um, when we start talking about this case in New York City. Whether or not in New York City you have a duty to retreat, in that situation, you, you're going to find that the subway train was moving and the doors were locked 
and everybody was terrified, desperately waiting for the next station to get there. So even if it's New York, you have a duty to retreat, if you can, in that situation, it appears nobody could retreat. Right. Well, a duty to retreat assumes, by definition, that you have an ability to retreat. Right. If you're, if you're cornered up against a wall and there's nowhere for you to go, there is no yeah. ability to retreat. Right. So, but again, just so that the audience is clear, stand your ground is a little bit different. Stand your ground takes that common law principle and eliminates the duty to retreat. And it extends that castle doctrine, that protection, that exception for your house to the entire geographical boundary of the, of the state of Florida I think or the any best, other. The best way to put it is it, it removes the duty to retreat Florida removes the duty to retreat and replaces it with you having to be in a place where you are legally allowed to be. That's it. If you have a legal right to be somewhere, you have no duty to retreat. So uh, now that can happen in your house. That could happen in a parking lot. That could happen in a restaurant. It could happen in a movie theater. It could happen on a boat. Wherever it could happen anywhere. Right. right. Wherever you have a legal right to be. So that's kind of the, the, the backstory. Now, what is defense of property and what is defense of others? Let's, let's talk about those two concepts. So if I walk out to my vehicle in my parking garage, Ed, and I see that as I'm approaching, one of my doors is open. And as I approach and get even closer, I see there's somebody inside my car. And as I get closer still, I say, hey, and it turns out there's somebody in my car I don't know burglarizing my car. Do I have the right to shoot that person then and there? I would argue no. Not to shoot no. it because it's force with force. And they're not. So, well, first off, before we even get to force with force, I haven't been threatened. Right. Now, I'll change this up a little bit in a minute. Let's say, for example, I say, hey, what are you doing? And the guy gets out and he's holding a gun and pointing it at me. Different story. So, but we're not there. We're just talking about property. Yes. Now, is there any question that my property is being criminalized against the law and my wishes for the sake of this argument we're going to say no that you have correct no doubt that they're trying to steal your car right this person has no authority to be in my car he has no right to be in my car he has illegally broken and entered my car he is committing a, 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 a and actually committing a felony right. committing without, a burglary. the best way to say without any other facts like he's puking in your floorboard of your car which might lead you to believe he's drunk and has no idea what he's doing Without any other facts, yeah, you have every right to believe that this guy's trying to break into your car and steal something. So, am I allowed to defend my car? Am I allowed to do anything in defense of my property? Not anything, but yes, you are allowed to defend Well, it. am I allowed to take any action? And if so, what action am I allowed to take? Where are the limitations on that? The reasonable, you're allowed to do what's reasonable in that situation. Detain him, hold him, call the cops, tell him he can't leave. Things of that nature. And if it turns, as you said, I'll leave it to you because you want to talk about it. What if you say, hey, man, what are you doing? Stay right there. Don't move. And he turns around and now he pulls a knife on you. Well, let's say he pulls nothing. Let's say he has no weapon. What if I decide I'm going to call the police, but I don't want this guy to flee. I have a gun. I pull out my gun and I say, don't move or I'm going to shoot your ass. And I hold my gun on him. I pick up my phone. I dial 911 and I say, my name is Mike. Uh, I'm at this location. I have a firearm out. I am holding a guy who was breaking into my vehicle at gunpoint. I need you to get a police officer here right now so he doesn't get away. I'm, I'm laughing because I have a feeling you've done the research and I haven't done the research on that specific instance. But I would guess my legal gut instinct, without having had any case law research or a case that ever involved that, is that, yeah, at that point you're allowed because you're just doing an ag assault with a firearm. Which I think the answer, the answer is going to be, it depends, but I agree with you. I think overall, the crime that you would have committed if you had committed any crime would be aggravated assault with a firearm. You are, you are pointing a deadly weapon, a firearm at some other person under threat to that person that they could be injured. And therefore, you've created a well-founded fear in their mind that is clearly an aggravated assault. And if it's a firearm, it's clearly an aggravated assault with a firearm, which carries a three-year minimum mandatory. But an affirmative defense to that would be that you are acting in either self-defense, defense of others, or defense of property. 
Right. I don't know whether it flies in that case. I think you get the instruction and it goes to a jury. I, I think you're going to have a very hard time winning a standard round case on that. But it's conceivable. If I knew you were going to pre present that, that hypothetical, I would have done a little research. But I would guess, I would say it's better than a 50-50 shot that you're okay with that as long as it's crystal clear that they were trying to steal your car or something of that nature. Let's mix it up. Let's make it a little, let's make it a little more interesting. The guy comes out, you, you've got the gun, you tell him to stay there, and he starts running. So you shoot at him. You don't hit him. You don't want to hit him. You just want to fire a shot so that he knows you're serious. So you nope. shoot the ground. No, 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 no. I don't care what the research says. I don't care if you show me 900 cases <laughs> of precedent from the United States Supreme Court that says it's okay. I'm telling you, as your lawyer, do not. It's a dangerous weapon. People die easily. All things could, a lot of things could go wrong. Well, They're let's rushing. forget. And let's it was, forget. Oh, Michael, let me get this, make sure I'm crystal clear. If it's property and they're running, just let them go. Just let them and, go. And I'm going to tell you the why of that. Apart from the common sense, which you alluded to, which is, you know, that bullet's going to go somewhere. I mean, maybe it'll impale itself in the ground, but maybe it'll ricochet. Maybe it will hit somebody else that you didn't intend to hit. Maybe it will cause damage to somebody else's property. God forbid you hit the sewage drain and then we got to smell all that crap for days. Don't well, do it. Here, here's the law in Florida. It is an affirmative defense that you can use non-deadly force to protect your land, your home, your vehicle, or other items of personal property. However, Florida does not recognize a right to use deadly force ever, only in the protection of property interests. So you can never use deadly force to protect your property. You can use force, but you can't use deadly force. And so now, and at that point, Mike, it creates another scenario, right? It creates a scenario of some witness or somebody watching or some situation where you say, no, I fired a warning shot. And another witness says, no, man, I saw him. He was trying to hit the guy in the back. And now you put the prosecution and the police in a very difficult situation. They have a witness who says they think you were shooting at him. And you, of course, because it would make sense if you did try to shoot the guy, that you'd be denying it, that maybe you're lying about it. Well, I, we've do just it. established you can't do it for property anyhow. Just run so, out the guy. Just run now out. That we, now, run. That we, now that we've talked about property, right. I mean, I think if you wanted to run after him and tackle him and hold him there until the cops came, Stay well, safe. that's going to dovetail into our New York City case. But let's let's now that we've kind of defined self-defense and we've specifically talked about property, let's talk about our our local uh, Opalaka genius, Mr. Munoz. Um, do you want to uh, read oh, no. his A form or do you want to just discuss? I want you to start because I'm going to give you a little surprise. OK, so I'm going to read the oh, A form. Hey, wait, let me let me let me let me tease the surprise. In both this case and in listening to the audio and doing some research for the Mr. Penny in New York City, I think you're going to find that, in my opinion, the reason both these men got arrested is in large part due to something that you have mentioned many, many times. I have mentioned many, many times, and it's one of your mantras that you say to your clients. But I'll let everybody know. When you finish reading the eighth. Oh, yeah. No, I, I I read his statements. It's the up X2. So, all right. Let, let me just read this off real quick because it's not that not that long. Uh, on November 10th, 2023, at approximately 1.01 p.m., uh, Opalaka units responded in emergency mode to a specific address in reference to a male who was shot. Officer Blank was the first officer on scene. He made contact with the defendant who was sitting inside of his vehicle, officer removed a firearm. Huh? She was a female. I'm not saying the name. No, officer, I, know that he, I know it was a female. Officer removed the firearm from the defendant's waistline. Subsequently, another officer, two other officers arrived on the scene. As the victim who was lying on the ground appeared to suffer from multiple gunshot wounds, subsequently victim was transported to rider trauma. On November 10th at approximately 2.20, 2.30 in the afternoon, this detective arrived on the scene and made contact with, uh, with the first officer. 
Thereupon, the first officer advised that the defendant is currently in custody. Then Opelaka Crime Scene Unit responded to process the scene. Afterward, defendant was transported to the station pending investigation. Prior to interviewing, he was presented with a standardized pre-printed Opelaka PD Miranda form in English and Spanish, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Defendant agreed to speak, and this is what he said. At approximately 12 o'clock, he began receiving notifications on his phone, alerting him that an unknown male was inside of his business. At that point, defendant drove to his business. It took him 10 minutes to arrive. During that 10-minute drive, the defendant did not attempt to call police. When defendant arrived at the business, he observed a black male, the victim, in which he described outside the business, standing next to his vehicle, before the defendant exited his own vehicle, he reached under his car seat and armed himself. At that point, defendant exited his vehicle while carrying his firearm and began to confront the victim. Defendant was standing in front of the victim's vehicle. Subsequently, defendant shot multiple rounds at victim. As the victim retrieved for cover behind his vehicle and ducked at the same time, defendant continued to fire multiple rounds at victim, at which he struck the victim. At that point, the victim was on the ground. The defendant then walked toward the victim as he was pointing his firearm at the victim. The defendant then shot the victim vehicle tires to make sure that victim did not escape his presence. Defendant then called 911. Furthermore, defendant mentioned victim had burglarized his business before. Lastly, defendant said he wanted to take matters on his own. Defendant was charged and transported. He was actually charged by Opelaka PD with attempted first degree murder. Yeah, uh, that was a little reach, I think, on their part. But all right. So what's the first lesson we've learned, Michael? Except uh, what is it? Up X2. Hashtag up X2. Shut right. up and lawyer up. I have it on, on authority and I cannot reveal my sources, but I have it on authority that he was told several times. Several times by law enforcement, he was told, you sure you want to give a statement without your lawyer? And he was still too dense to see that the officers were trying to tell him, shut up. He must have spoken. I think he said a lot more than what's in that A form. And I think what ended up happening was that it was determined that this man was not a threat to his person. I don't know because we don't know. We don't like you said, we don't have all the discovery. But if I'm if I'm doing a little uh, a little Clouseau, a little Colombo detectiving here, I think what they probably ultimately determined was that he was not a threat to the defendant's person. Now, we don't know. We don't know because we don't have all the evidence. For all we know, that guy might have said, you know, F you, I'm going to take that gun and shove it up your butt and, and he lunged at him. I don't know. But this is a good scenario why we say stay quiet. This is why we tell you call your lawyer. Because had, he, had Michael got onto the scene or I got onto the scene and I would have said to him or Michael, what happened? And he would have told us that. I would have said, shut up. Right, Mike? I would have said, shut up. You're not talking to him. You're not talking to him. Because by everything he told them gives them a reason to believe that this was a vendetta because he was pissed that the guy had robbed him from before. That's it. So and why bother saying that? So let, But let's step back a few steps. There's no indication anywhere in here, and, and I would assume that if he had said something along these lines, it would be in this police report, because why wouldn't it? We hope. There's right. no suggestion in here that he felt personally threatened or, or unsafe. Right. There is a statement, and I don't know whether it's just because this is so poorly written. I mean, the grammar is so bad. This who this officer that wrote this police report needs a remedial grammar class. It's terrible. But and the sergeant who allowed it to go out that way, like there, there, must have known well, that be a again, one two words or one hyphenated word, opalaka. So, um, look, what we know is that at noon this guy gets notified on his phone. This is what he tells them, right? And he says that he got notified that um, that I wanted to find the exact words. While you're looking for it, that also leads me to believe that there were there's video cameras of this. So hopefully there's a video. Mayor, well, if he's, if he's lucky or unlucky, there will be. 
for his sake, I was going to say, hopefully there's a video of it. And for his sake, it shows that he actually did act in self-defense. Okay, so it says that he was receiving the notifications on his phone, alerting him that an unknown male was inside of his business. That word unknown is important because he later says that he knew this guy had, had, had tried to break into his business previously or had broken in either way. Yeah. But whether he knew that at the time, we don't know. It seems to be, if you read this literally, that the images did not show him who this person was. And when he got there, that connection was made. So he may have gone there legitimately not knowing it was this guy, or it may have been the case that he knew damn well who it was. Right. I don't know. But here's what I do know, and here's where his first mistake was. You know the movie True Romance? Of course. Love that movie. So one of my favorite cameos of all time is Gary Oldman in that movie. Do you remember the role Gary Oldman played? A white Jamaican guy. That's Drexel. Yeah. Drexel, right. Anyhow, I'll get back to Drexel later. They wouldn't let him do that today, but he did a great job. Yeah, well, it reminds me of Robert Downey in Tropic Thunder. Right. So, yeah, apparently you can't go to a football game uh, at Kansas City either with face paint on. But especially, and wearing uh, a Native American headgear, especially when your grandfather is a Native American who's on the committee of a Native American tribe, by the way. But let's just, I digress. But we digress. But we digress. You digress. So, so we don't know what this guy knew at the time, but he may or may not have known, right? He may or may not have known that this was the guy. So the question now becomes, and this is where I, where I brought Drexel, that character up, was there's one point in time where uh, uh, Christian Slater shows up and he, you know, wants to confront Drexel, right, about letting his, his, buy, his girlfriend go. He wants to buy and, uh, uh, Arquette from him. And he says... What we have here is an MF in Charles Bronson. <laughs> and that's exactly what we have here. We have a guy whose first mistake was to be Charles Bronson. When you get advised that there's a burglary in progress, first off, I don't know why you're being advised and the police aren't being advised, but I'm assuming that he had some sort of surveillance or some sort of uh, alarm system that, that contacted him right away and did not contact the police. Mistake number one. Mistake number two is, why did he not call the police and say, hey, my name is Joe. I just got an alert that my business located at X address is being burglarized. I'm on my way there. Please send officers. Not I guarantee you 911 would have said to him, sir, don't go. We're going to go and we'll let you know when it's okay to show up. But either way, he covers his ass initially up front by making that call. Correct. Because in, when, fairness, Mike, in fairness, maybe he thought the burglar was gone by the time he'd get there, he'd be gone. I get all that. But like Mike says, Call 911 so we could see your intentions were not to confront anybody, not to go, not to go Charles Bronson, as somebody, as you say. And your intention was to just hopefully catch the person who was stealing from you. Exactly. So we don't know the answer to that question, but we but we do know that nowhere in this statement that he makes, which is so horrible, he serves himself up for a conviction. Um and as bad as Opalaka is, and they are bad reputationally, they took him to Metro for um, interrogation. So I guarantee you that that interrogation is both video and audio recorded. Right. So these statements, uh, it's very difficult for me to believe that that were not substantially, at least, if not verb verbatim, at least substantially made by him. Right. And basically what he says is, hey, I... I do what I want because it's my business and I want to do it. Nowhere in here does he levy the magic words, whether they're true or not. And I'm supposing that they're probably not because if they were, he probably would have said them. Um, but nowhere in here does he say, I was threatened. I felt threatened. I was scared. I felt like this. Because even if he makes the dumb mistake of making the Charles Bronson move to show up without calling the cops, he has every right to do that. It's not the smart thing to do. It's not the prudent thing to do, but there's no law that says that he can't do that. Right. And if he does show up lawfully at his own business and he is then confronted by an act of violence, he is entitled to use that amount of force, which is commensurate with the force being used against him reasonably under the circumstances. The problem so, with a situation like this, Michael, is, you know, you're, you're emotional. It's your stuff. It's your personal property. 
You've been burglarized before. Who knows how many times? We all get it, right? You're pissed off that you bust your ass every day to try to make something, and people come and just try and steal it from you. Well, that energy is the energy that you as a citizen need to be careful of because you are emotional. The reason you call the cops because the cops will show up and they won't be emotional. They're not going to try to kill somebody just because they stole your stuff. You might, and understandably, because you're emotional. This is why it was a bad idea for him to go there without police. But And an even worse idea for him to wave Miranda. Worse. That was and, a big mistake. And to give a horribly incriminating statement. Um, this guy has walked himself right into an attempted murder. And, and God forbid that, that this guy dies as a result of, of those wounds. Uh, then he's looking at a real murder. Either way, right now, if they charge him with attempted first degree murder, he's looking at life in prison. And I will say one other thing about the A form that is very troubling and concerning. If you notice, Mike, they're trying to claim, or at least that's what it says on the A form, that only one of the officers, which I believe is the the lead detective who's investigating it, was wearing a body cam. I, I find that extremely difficult to believe because every officer in Opalaka has a body cam. Or should. And, and I want to see, if I'm representing him, I want to see these because I want to see his demeanor. I want to see what was said when it was spur of the moment. Because at this point, let's be honest, we got nothing to lose. We can only hope that he said something that'll show that he feared for his life. Because right now, it doesn't look very good for him. No. And so let's switch gears now and, and talk about Mr. Penny, who, again, this is a guy who is not in fear for himself. He's six foot two. He's 24 years old. He's a Marine. I disagree with you, but go ahead. I'll tell you well, why. You could disagree all you want, but I'm going to play a video in a minute, where, which is him speaking, where he flat out says, I wasn't afraid for myself. I was afraid for the other people on the train. Listen to what he says in that video. That's what I'm saying. He's saying in the military, it's not that you're not afraid. He says when you're in the military, you're taught that courage is acting even though you're afraid. Right. I, so I understand. But this he doesn't. Why I said, he never, why I said he should have kept his mouth shut too, because I'm sure he was just talking about his actions, not realizing that in fact he probably was also afraid. But because of his training, he was over to he was able to overcome that fear. Well, I would say it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. I think it's better if you are in fear for yourself. But in the state of Florida, and again, I can't speak to New York, but had that happened here, he has the right to use force, including deadly force. Correct. Even if he's not in, in defense of others. Right. That is the law in the state of Florida. So if I'm walking through the parking lot and I see some uh, lady, hear some lady hear shrieking and I look around and I look around and I see a lady on the ground with two guys rolling on top of her and, you know, her clothes are in disarray and arms are flailing. And it appears to me that she's being sexually assaulted. And I come up and pull out my gun and say, stop what you're doing right now. And one of the guys, you know, says, I'll, I'll freaking kill her if you come any closer. I'm going to cap him right in the head and be okay. Right. And because my, that's defense of others. Yeah, and my point I'm trying to make, Michael, is, you know, I, I would love to think that if I'm in that situation and somebody else is in danger, that I would act and try to save that person and help that person. But I also think that I know I would probably be afraid for myself as well. I think one of the point I'm trying to make here for the citizens is, don't don't be don't be macho. Don't be don't be too bravado. And let's be honest. Well, you don't fear for your own safety. You would have walked in there like you were bulletproof. You're, the reason you're hiding, the reason you're pulling a gun out, is because you do fear for your own safety. Now, you may have courage. You may have enough courage to overcome that fear, but that doesn't mean you don't have the fear. So, this is why X up to shut up. Just shut up, lawyer up, let the lawyer get there, let the lawyer talk to you. We're never going to tell somebody to lie. That would be 100% unethical as a lawyer and personally, morally, I think it would be unethical for me. But I may want to talk to you and say, what do you mean you're not afraid, dude? You were you were ducked behind a car. If you're not afraid, why didn't you walk out there like you were Superman? You're bulletproof, right? Well, I didn't want to get shot at. I was scared of getting shot. Okay, so then you are afraid. You just overcame that fear. So just shut up and let me handle this. Because you don't even realize what you're doing. You're walking yourself into a conviction when you're actually innocent. You know, now that I'm thinking about it, I want to show these videos in reverse order than I listed them. I think I want to show Mr. Penny's statement before I show what happened on the video, on the subway. 
So if, if our producers could do that, can you cue up the YouTube video first? I'm sorry. I know I asked you to do uh, the, the other one first, but if you can switch them over and do the YouTube video, the statement video, uh, put that up any, any time now, that would be great. Well, I live in the East Village in Manhattan, so I take the subway multiple times a day. In this instance, I was coming from school. I got out of class around 2.15. And I took the J Street, I was at J Street Metro Tech, took the Uptown F train um, at Second Avenue. Um, a man came on, stumbled on, he was, appeared to be on drugs. Um, the doors closed and he ripped his jacket off and, violent, and threw it at the people sitting down to my left. I was listening to music at the time um, and he was yelling. So I took my headphones out to hear what he was yelling. And the three main threats that he repeated over and over was, I'm gonna kill you. I'm prepared to go to jail for life, and I'm willing to die. You know, this is a this was a scary situation, and uh, Mr. Neely came on. He was he was threatening. He's, he's a, I'm six two, and he was taller than me, so it was. And there's a common misconception that Marines don't get scared. We're actually taught uh, one of our core values is courage, and courage is not the absence of fear, but how you handle fear. And you know. I was scared for myself, but I looked around, I saw women and children. He was yelling in their faces, saying, saying these threats. I couldn't just sit still. Some people say that I was holding on to Mr. Neely for 15 minutes. This is not true. I mean, between stops is only a couple minutes. So the whole interaction less, less than less than five minutes. Some people say I was trying to choke him to death, which is also not true. I was trying to restrain him. Uh, you can see in the video, there's a clear rise and fall of his chest indicating that he's breathing. I'm trying to restrain him from him being able to carry out the threats. And then some people say that this is about race, which is absolutely ridiculous. I didn't see a black man threatening passengers. I saw a man threatening passengers, it's a lot of whom were people of color. A man who helped restrain Mr. Neely was, was a person of color. And then a few days after the incident, I, I read in the papers that uh, a woman of color came out and called me a hero. What, I don't believe that I'm, I'm a hero, but uh, she was one of those people that I was trying to protect. We were all scared. Mr. Neely was yelling in these passengers' faces and they looked terrified. Um, the reason why there was no video at the start of the altercation was because people were too afraid getting away from him. And the, the, didn't, the videos didn't start until they saw that situation was under control. I knew I had to act and I acted in a way that would protect the other passengers, protect myself, and protect Mr. Neely. I used this hole to restrain him, and I did this by leaving my hand on top of his head to control his body. You can see in the video, there's a clear rise and fall of his chest indicating that he was still breathing. And I'm calibrating my grip based on, on the force that he's exerting. And um, I just, I, I mean, I was trying to keep him on the ground as, until the police came. I was praying that the police would come and take this situation, under, uh, take this situation over. I didn't want to be put in that situation, but I couldn't just sit still and let, let him carry out these threats. Let's, before we even talk any, about anything, I want to play the video of the subway. So let's play the other video now so that you can, with context, understand what he just explained and see it for yourself.
cops. The cops. Thank you. So, look, there you have what happened on that subway. Now the question is, number one, and Ed, I apologize, you know, in terms of, of there is a potential self-defense claim here, but I think the primary claim was defense of others, but still there, there is a, a potential for self-defense. Either way, the issue is, does it fly? I mean, I think, I think the problem he's going to have is twofold, right? One is factual, in my opinion. And I say this term loosely. Um, I think the New York DA is looking at this perhaps and thinking, well, did he actually carry out any of those threats? Was this amount of force necessary? Because he was saying he was going to do these things, but was he? did he actually make any move to carry them out? Now, the other one is reality. It's objective, I guess, I mean, subjective rather, it's subjective, and perhaps it's opinion, but anybody who's ever been in a situation where life and death situations have, have occurred, where people have tried to kill other people or hurt other people, will understand what I'm saying. And I think this DA and many DAs in certain cities don't understand what I'm about to tell you. They see it as wait till they do something. Well, the problem with that is somebody, an innocent civilian, might be dead. See, I think Penny did the right thing. I think Penny thought, what am I waiting for? This guy keeps threatening. He won't shut up. He's getting in people's faces. We're in a tube, underground, stuck. What I don't know if you noticed. Wait for him to kill somebody before I do something? I don't know if you noticed from the visual that everybody on the, the train, including the African-American male who was helping to hold him down and the other male that was standing up on the far side, they were all wearing leather jackets and coats. It was obviously it was cold, right? Um, because they were all bundled up like wintertime clothing. So the allegation was that this guy got on the, the the train and the first thing he did was take off his jacket and 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 throw it at the people at somebody. Yeah, yeah. Which so in itself is a battery, right? And as it turns out, 
unfortunately, this individual was suffered from severe mental illness. He was on the city's, uh, you know, top 100 or 200 list of, of people in need of mental services. Some some inane situation where they maintain a list of people that they don't give services to. Right. So then why hadn't the city provided the services? Plus, there's no cops anywhere to be found on the subway or near the subway. Because Adams pulled all the officers from the subway train because they were they were threatening. The officers yeah. appeared. It was a microaggression. It would threaten people. Well, this is what you have. So so this is this is what happened. Now I find this interesting because um there's a, there was a very long motion to suppress filed by the, the defense, and that's yet to be a motion to dismiss that's yet to be litigated. But one of the things that's in here, and I'm going to read it verbatim, the medical examiner conceded in her testimony that, quote, not every chokehold is a lethal chokehold. Um, and then the government presented an expert witness who was a sergeant. I don't know who he's a sergeant for, but his name is Caliber who said that Mr. Penny was trained to use, he said the hold Mr. Penny was trained to use was a non-lethal tool utilized to subdue an aggressor by rendering him unconscious or to gain control of a situation using less than lethal force. He said the hold can be fatal if it is fully applied, yet he was clear in his analysis of this particular hold that Mr. Penny did not apply it to the full extent. In other words, he did not have the intent for lethality because his intention was consistent with training, specifically to gain control of a situation in a non-lethal manner. And Michael, I'm not an expert, and I shall neither confirm nor deny <laughs> how many physical altercations I may have been involved in in my life, especially growing up. But I can tell you this, when somebody's really trying to choke you the hell out, your only instinct is to grab the arm that's cutting off the airways. I'm telling you that maybe, maybe not from experience on both ends of the spectrum. But when you choke somebody and you really want to choke them to death, the only thing your brain tells you is get that threat off your neck. And no time was this guy doing that. He wasn't pulling on Penny's arm to get it away from his neck to try and breathe. You saw his lips move. You saw him fighting, trying to struggle to get away. The only reason people try to struggle to get away is when they don't fear that they can't breathe. If you can't breathe, think about it. If you can't breathe, what's, have you ever choked on a piece of food? Like really choked? Where your airway is trapped and you, you can't breathe? Your only concern is getting that thing out of your throat. So, And then you heard one of the guys say, be careful. And even the bystander said he's not choking him hard. And that guy that was helping him hold him down says, no, 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 he's not choking him hard. I think this is a combination where this guy was probably on some drugs. I don't know. We haven't seen the medical report. His mental health issues. And the fact that this that Penny was choking him, putting a chokehold. I think the chokehold may have been, you know, for uh, under any other circumstance, fine. But I think in this circumstance, since this guy was already close to death anyway, this is what maybe put him over the edge. But again, what, what I think we have to go back to square one. What would you have Penny do? Wait till he kills somebody? Wait till he makes good on the threat? And then you want him to put him in a chokehold? So an innocent civilian, a mother or a father or a child or a sister or a brother or a husband or a wife is dead because the New York City DA wants you to wait for them to kill somebody before you do something? I think we've gotten a place in America where they put the the light most favorable in the, the in the uh, they look at it in the light most favorable to the alleged victim or in this case the aggressor. Why are we looking at the light most favorable to the aggressor? He started this by getting into the train and threatening to kill people. What did he think was going to happen? And everybody was going to say, "Ah, that's just that's just Neely. He's just screwing around again." No, people took him seriously. He started it. So. I, I don't know. I, I, I think I think it's unfortunate for everybody. But I think Neely did what he should have done. I mean, what are you going to do? Wait for somebody to die? Well, I, I'm listen, I can't say I disagree on a personal level with any of that. Um, I, 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 I want I they would have been better for Neely. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. I'm starting to think in the next time in a situation like that, he should just cold cock the guy or just grab his arm and break his arm. 
Break his arm. At least you know you won't kill him. Don't use a chokehold anymore. Well, part of the problem is now he's looking at 15 years in prison. I mean, this is these are very serious charges. I'm sure, I'm sure Neely, as an ex-Marine, has been trained enough to de decap, you know, to, to, to not decapitate, to to incapacitate an aggressor. He could have grabbed his arm, broken him at broken his arm at the elbow, punched him in the face, done something that might have broken a bone or a, or an orbital socket or something. And at least he wouldn't have killed the guy. I mean, look. And I'm saying this half-heartedly and half-facetiously because Neely is putting him in a chokehold because the, the reason that sergeant talked about that, that that's a training that they use to subdue people, is that chokehold is supposed to be the least painful, the least dangerous, the one that causes the least amount of injuries, right? But it's getting to a point where if you apply a chokehold and somebody accidentally dies, even if you're doing it in self-defense or defense of others, they're going to try and charge you with murder. So you might as well break bones, break a kneecap. Uh -huh. I think that there's also a, a, an, another issue, another layer from this onion. And that, of course, is the racial issue. Um, you know, you have a, a white guy aggressor against a black guy victim. Well, or, I mean, I'm, and I'm using those words, you know, maybe not appropriately that way. But from the filter of the, the charging authority in this particular case, that's how they viewed it. They viewed uh, Penny as the aggressor and Neely as the victim. Um, and and Penny, the aggressor, happens to be a, a, a white male, and Neely, the victim, happens to be a black male. Yeah, I think a lot of protests. And so I think I think you're right. I think part of it is that that this New York DA succumbed, succumbed to their succumbed to mm -hmm. the to the to the protest and the optics of it. I don't think he succumbed to any of it. I think that's his his inclination. I think that's his go-to guttural reaction you know i mean this is a guy who who is charging he you know he had a i forget the guy's name but there was a bodega owner yeah. that spent months in rikers island uh facing homicide charges for defending his shop against an armed robbery it was on video so you know i mean they're not prosecuting people who are smashing storefronts and 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 and, and mass shopliftings and even carjackings you know, people are walking away from an awful lot of, of, of offenses without prosecution, whereas civilians and storekeepers are told, do not defend yourself. So the reason that I think that this is interesting is because it's a tale of two different states, right? Yeah. Florida is a very different state. Here, I mean, nobody's going to support a unlawful Charles Bronson act of vigilante justice. That's not what Florida stands for. I don't think that's what any United States law basically stands for. But they are going to say what you said. You don't have to sit there and wait to be a victim. You don't have to wait for somebody to injure you. You don't have to wait for somebody to kill somebody else before you take action. And part of the problem is the guttural reaction to that based on the visual. Right. You had a you had a this is coming off of the heels of of Derek Chauvin and, uh, uh, you know, out, out in Seattle um, uh, with that horrible case where, you know, you had you had another chokehold by a law enforcement officer. So Penny's not a cop, but he's a Marine. So it's still kind of that authority law enforcement mentality. It's, again, a white uh, in the eyes of the law aggressor. And I mean, look, I, I hate the Monday morning quarterback because I think Penny was truly had his heart in the right place. And although he says he doesn't consider himself a hero, I think he acted like one. I think he put himself in a dangerous situation to try and protect others, including himself, but also others. But, you know, in a situation like that, since we're talking as, as a learning tool, you know, Penny, I think, knows that he could handle himself. Doesn't appear that this guy nearly had any weapons. I think it would have been smarter in that situation for maybe Penny to get up and get, draw his attention and say, listen, if you're going to kill anybody, kill me. Let's go. Kill me. Kill me and draw his attention away from all the civilians and then be ready for an attack. Well, and I, I guess in a perfect world, if you have 2020 20 vision, you know. I, I, what did I say? I'm Monday morning quarterback. We're in the we're in the we're in the film room and we're just trying to learn for the next time. That's so this happens because we got to be careful that we have law enforcement out there. We have prosecutors out there. Even in this state, there's some counties in this state 
that I think are a little naive as to the realities of life and what, what the reality of the world really is. And they might take a situation like this here in Dade County and do the same thing. They might. I've seen it happen. I've seen I've heard I've heard prosecutors in this county, Michael, tell me that they charged a guy with murder because even though the victim had a firearm pointed at him, he didn't he didn't wait for the guy to fire that the defendant never saw the muzzle flash. I mean, that's the kind of stupidity that you hear coming from some. Um, and I say stupidity as kindly as I can. Maybe I should choose ignorance because I think it comes from people that don't understand. They have no common sense and they don't have real world experience. They think life is like a Rambo movie and the good guy never gets shot. No. If you wait to see the muzzle flash, it's too late. So This takes me to, to an adage and my last question that I'm going to wrap this show up with. The adage is no good deed goes unpunished. You know, there is a reason that we have proverbs and adages. And the reason they're there is because they're time, usually time tested and proven. They're, they're generally true. Not always, but generally. You know, you want to do good. You want to help people. You want to be a good Samaritan. Oftentimes, it don't pay. Because you're the one who winds up paying the price for your good deed. Ergo, it does not go unpunished. And that dovetails into the last question that I would ask. And it's rhetoric, but we can answer it anyhow. Is it better to SYG, stand your ground, or GTFO? <laughs> well, but here, it's not just rhetorical, because I think, I, 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 I respectfully, I will disagree with you. I think it's inbred. Remember, in, in trauma situations, people instinctively have a fight, flight, or freeze reaction. And I think Penny was trained to fight. He was trained, don't, don't run and don't freeze. Other people don't. Look, I can tell you, for whatever reason, the way I was raised, Michael, I've caught myself over the years realizing that it's, it's in my DNA. I, when I'm scared, when I'm threatened, when I'm presented with a traumatic or scary situation, I fight. Because the way I was raised, running or freezing was 10 times worse. You had to, you had to stand up because there was no running from it. So... I think Penny did what he would normally do, which was, here's a bad situation. Here's a scary situation. I got to fight. And I think the others fled. Their, their reaction was to try and flee. And Munoz is the exact opposite. Right. M yeah, Munoz. I, I mean, I feel for the guy. I understand 100% why he did what he did. And I'm hoping that there's some kind of a threat that was presented to him. Um, thankfully nobody died. Thankfully. Yeah. Yeah. But well, he shot him multiple times. If he didn't die, he probably shot him with a nine, but which is, you know, had the wrong ammo. That's a story for another day, but hope I'm so, I mean, I am thankful that no one died because I, I would hate for anybody to die in any kind of a situation. But I think Munoz, if it turns out to be the way that a form was written, Somebody should have talked to him beforehand and say, listen, no matter how, much, how pissed off you are and, and rightfully so, it's just it's just material things, man. It's just money. Have faith in God. He will bless you. He'll give you back. Let that guy steal it. You don't know why he's stealing it. Maybe he needs to steal it. Just let it go and pray to God and say, dude, you got to hook me up here because I wanted to kill that guy, but I didn't kill him because of you. So you better give me back my money. Well, theoretically, he can say that, right? He, he may have wanted to kill that guy, but he didn't kill him. <laughs> Thank God for him. So God. I, I would say as my non-rhetoric answer, I'm, I, you know, I, look, I'm the opposite, Ed. If I, don't, if I know I can get away from I, a, a, a confrontation safely, I, I just assume swallow my pride and leave and not have the fight. But here's where you missed the point. It's not a conscious thought. It's not like in situation. No, I understand. You're, it's, it's reactive. It's, I just react. I get it. And then after the fact, I think, you know, I probably could have walked away from this. So the action. I, I think we're all wired a little bit differently, but the important things, the takeaways here, the pro tips, if you will, again, think before you act. Um, if you are a victim and you can call the police, call 911, because call that call is going to be time stamped and recorded. And so if you are in fear, if you are in danger, if you are observing somebody else in danger or property in danger, you can confirm that in real time in a recording that will preserve it as fact. Now, whether or not it's actually true, at least you preserve 
that that was your observation, right? right? Then if you're going to act, you got to know how you're acting and what you're at, what the possible repercussions of your actions can be. So don't be Charles Bronson. Don't don't be that guy who has to go out and get retribution. Instead, let the system do the retribution for you. That's what prosecutors and judges and corrections officers are there to do. They're there to serve justice. Right. If I could add just two more things. One, stop trying to be, uh, and I, when I say macho, I don't mean just men because women can try and be just as macho as men. Stop trying to be that. If you're scared, say it. There's nothing wrong with saying you're scared. On the contrary, if you're not scared, you're probably nuts. Everybody's scared. The question is that you can overcome it because you have courage. And the other one is try as much as you can to anticipate these situations, right? There are things that we can all anticipate. We know people drive like complete morons in Dade County, Florida, right? So almost every day you should tell yourself before you even get in your car, I know some asshole is going to cut me off today. And then after he cuts me off, he's going to flip me the bird and he's going to start yelling and screaming at me. You know what? When it happens today, I'm not going to get out of my car. I'm not going to like me. I'm just going to laugh and smile at him and wave so that when it comes up, if your DNA is wired the way mine is, you can overcome that DNA and say, aha, I knew it was going to happen. I got you. As as Dave Chappelle says, gotcha, bitch. I'm not going to get involved. I'm just going to let it go. Apropos of that, that's reason number 147 why I generally do not carry a gun. (laughs) If I don't have a gun in my car, I can't use it. On the flip side of the coin, you know, there's there's another adage. It's better to be judged by 12 than carried by six. Yep. So I guess you got to kind of weigh those those uh, those those factors and figure out your own way. But look, either way, I think it was an interesting discussion. Um, I certainly wish both Mr. Munoz and, and Mr. Penny the best. Um, I, I feel especially bad for Penny because I find it very difficult to justify Munoz's actions. But I think Penny's were very altruistic. I think Penny's were very altruistic and selfless. Um, and, and if he was scared for himself, I think he was far more concerned about the other people than he was uh, about his own safety. Which but, shows he's a hero. He put himself in peril because, in my opinion, and this is my, my opinion, that's why I say he is a hero. Because he thought of others more than himself. He could have easily said, look, I'm sitting right here. If this guy tries to come and kill me, I'm telling you, he's, I'm taking him out. I've got the training and experience to take this guy out. Hand-to-hand combat, he's going to lose. No Michael Jackson impersonator is going to beat the shit out of this Marine. However, he thought, but look at these poor people around me. They probably don't have the training. Michael Jackson could do a moonwalk on them and hurt them. So I got to I gotta get involved and help these people. So I agree with you. I feel much, I feel really bad for that Penny guy. So uh, last note I want to make is a programming note. Um, Today is December 4th, and next week is the 11th. I understand, Ed, you have a, a, a trial call on the 11th, and you believe you will be going to trial. Looks so, like I don't, so I don't know that we'll have a show next week. Maybe we will uh, if Ed's case gets continued or if I decide to do it with a guest. Um, but the week after that, uh, oh, actually, the week, is your trial on the 11th or the 18th? The 11th. Oh, so we could theoretically do a show on the 18th. Okay. So we may have one more show and then the, and then there'll be two weeks off because of Christmas and New Year's. So we may or may not have a show next week on the eight, on the 11th. We should have a show on the 18th, uh, but obviously we won't see you on Christmas Day or on uh, or on the uh, day before New Year's Eve. With that said, I want to thank everybody for watching episode number 80. I hope you got something out of it. Uh, Ed said it several, several times, but I'll repeat it once more. Hashtag up X two. Shut up and lawyer up. Invoke the fifth and the sixth. Assert your privilege against compulsory self-incrimination and right to counsel. Every time you do that, every time you do that, you make a founding father proud. Conversely, every time you don't do that, a founding father rolls in his grave. Don't make the founding fathers roll in their graves. They suffered enough. They sacrificed enough. They deserve to rest in pieces. All righty. Thank you, everybody.
Thank you, as Mike. soon as we get the uh, the YouTube link from our great producers over at Miami Community Newspapers, who we thank very much, we'll go ahead and upload everything to YouTube and put out the links for you. Thank you again for watching episode number 80 of At Your Service with Haber and Martinez. And we look forward to seeing you, if not next week on the 11th, the following week on the 18th. And prospectively wish you a happy, joyous, healthy, safe, secure, and wonderful holiday season. Take care, y'all.